I've seen since COVID, everyone is promoting self-care. Mm -hmm. A lot of the beauty industry, which is a booming industry, I think it's like supposed to be worth like 50 billion by 20 something in the next like 10 years is now pivoting to self-care and wellness. And that's all you hear now. I'm a wellness coach. I'm, you know, promoting fitness for wellness. I've even seen ads for vodka that have an essence of lavender like, and they're like, I, for your self-care. Oh, really? We're like, we're going right, to we're gonna really. poison ourselves and call it self-care? Cool. Right. So there's definitely an industry, I think, that the big companies are seeing it and they're jumping on it right now. But again, like, unless you're there for the, if your heart is in it and the purpose is in it, you'll shine through. Everybody, this is Sita Garrett with From Idea to Invention, a podcast for small businesses and inventors. Look, there, I, I did it without even like looking for the right for the, monitor. This, right for the monitor to tell me what the name of our podcast is. <laughs> so um, we are here today with Angelica. Ah, uh, come on. Ah, <laughs> try it out. Try it out. I want to hear you say it first. Havaras. I was going to say Javieras. Ooh, yes. It's Javieras, but I usually do get Javieras, Javieras, everything. Don't worry. You did good, though. Thank you. Thank you. You know, us with those, you know, multiple vowels next to each other, we just don't. (laughs) Yeah, my background is Greek, so you'll hear, like, so many, like, such long last names. It's okay. Right. (laughs) So... She is our guest today, and I'm going to read her. Oh, she is the founder and founder of Aromathani. Aromathani? No. Aromant. Okay, you say it. Very close. It's actually Aromanthi. Aromanthi. It's like, you know what? I figured it was prettier than what I was saying. (laughs) So I'm glad it is. Aromanthi, clean beauty and wellness. Um, I'm going to read her bio right quick. It says, I am Angelica is an entrepreneur and therapist with a passion for health, wellness, and nature. She has a diverse background in mental health and creative arts. Those are just two like awesome things to wrap together. Yeah. Um, she, uh, Aromanthi, Clean Beauty and Wellness is a brand built on the core values of transparency, ethics, sustainability, and total body well-being. Her mission is to unlock our self-care practice and aromatherapy products and create a path to a deeper self-awareness in its easiest way possible. Awesome. So I'm not going to keep reading because we need to start talking. So Angelica, tell us about, I assume you didn't arrive at this point just like yesterday. I imagine there's like a path or a story that led to you starting the business and the concept for the business. So kind of tell us, tell us a little bit of your background and then tell us about how, how the concept came to you and how it's come to fruition. Yeah. So uh, my background is in creative arts therapy. So essentially um, I'm your typical mental health counselor, but I use creativity and art as a tool and a method for self-expression to help bridge communication. So uh, not everyone is able to have the traditional talk therapy, right? It's really hard for us to express ourselves verbally and to share our feelings and our thoughts or, you know, the deep secrets that um, affect our day-to-day functioning. And so my training is in being able to communicate with different forms of self-expression on a creative level. So it could be through music, through painting, sculpture, writing, whatever it might be. It's a a training that allows me to get a deeper understanding. It allows me to connect with the person in front of me on a conscious level, but also on a subconscious level. So essentially it's kind of like, uh, let's say art is like a language and I'm trained to understand that type of language. So that's really the basis of uh, my training in terms of education. And 
a few years ago, I was working at a uh, Brooklyn hospital and I was working with pediatrics. So I was working on the pediatric floor and in the ICU for pediatrics. So I was working with kids and families and, you know, families that had little babies in the ICU or maybe like a 13 year old that was there for some some event and being hospitalized can be really traumatizing. So I started uh, doing art therapy in that environment and it's kind of how it opened up the pathway to aromatherapy. I was trying to figure out like, what, what can I use as a way to get people interested? That's also a way to process and a way to self care. And I I just stumbled upon aromatherapy and I saw that it gravitated with everyone of all different backgrounds and ages. And I was like, something's going on here. I need to really get a better understanding so I can be a better therapist and make sure it's safe for me and for my uh, clients and patients. So that's sort of how I got into the field of getting certified in aromatherapy. And then from there, I just started experimenting with formulas and using formulas for myself when it comes to like stress relief or um, any acne issues, kind of like everyday self-care. And then I started um, having my friends and family use the products and it's sort of morphed into this business. And now I'm an entrepreneur, which was never something I thought I would ever be, but it's really rewarding and I wouldn't change it for the world. I'm, I'm really grateful to be able to find this outlet and then find this path in terms of a career. Well, that's awesome. That's awesome. So, so do you still, cause that was one of my first questions as I was going through your webpage and, and, and your, your write up. Cause I had a question about how, how, how did forensic psychology, which is your undergrad, and then the creative arts therapy, which is your master's, how, how did that all tie together for your business? And, and you explained that, and now I, now I completely understand. But my question is, how does, um, do you still practice, like, um, treating, treating clients in the hospital with your aromatherapy um, mm-hmm. business as well? Um, I was. I stopped about, I want to say, might be a year now, actually. So I, um, I left the hospital. I was doing private practice. Mm-hmm. And um, I was doing a lot of, so there's traditional art therapy, which is like the deep psychoanalysis stuff. And then there's another form of therapy called art as therapy. So it's sort of like going down a more recreational route. I uh, have training in media theory. So it's me recognizing for this particular person that I'm working with, or even in my private practice, I was doing artist therapy for kids. So in a group setting, specific age group, maybe knowing if there's um, any developmental delays or anything like that, I would use catered art projects or art materials that was therapeutic in itself. Um, so that's what I started to do after the hospital. And then again, the aromatherapy just started to kind of grow and it's a little bit more in demand now. And, um, I'm slowly transitioning out of the traditional art therapy aspect and focusing more on making products and, you know, shipping out the material for, for people to use or doing workshops that are more aromatherapy based, but still have that underlying foundation with the creative arts therapy. So how, how did it come that you recognized that you needed to transition from the art therapy to the aromatherapy that, did you find that one was working better than the other or working kind of in tandem together? Or how does that work? Um, a little bit of one was kind of more in demand than the other. I found that people were more interested, um, not interested in buying product, but I saw that I was getting more orders. And so I would have to dedicate a lot more time to making my small batches, getting them packaged and delivered. And when it comes to art therapy or even catering specific art workshops, I I personally invest a lot of time and effort into deciding what is the directive that we're going to do. And so I felt like it was sort of 
consuming a lot of my energy that I personally wanted to redirect into the aromatic aspect. Plus COVID kind of hit and I saw like... <laughs> Had to pivot, huh? <laughs> yeah, kind, I mean, I guess that's really what it was. I, I just saw that this, it wasn't just channeling my personal um, sense of fulfillment, but I saw that people were beginning to rely on these products. Like people were looking for hand sanitizer and I just happened to have that as a product or mm -hmm. people were feeling really stressed out and having these slip, sleep issues. And so I was able to see like, this is a real thing. And now I don't know if it's because, you know, all my, my search engines are filled with self care products or like what to do for self care, but that's all I see in terms of ads. So there's definitely a demand and I guess COVID really did play a major role in that. Right. Cause I imagine it gave people, first of all, it forced people probably to see what issues they may have yes. or it brought the issues that they thought they could put, you know, underneath or they could suppress. Mm -hmm. And then they came, you know, exacerbated with COVID and it's like, okay, now I need to deal with this. And I want to probably deal with it in a, a way that seems more natural than, than, you know, can I go to my doctor or do I even really want to go to my doctor? Yeah. For exactly. This? exactly. There's so, so many limitations that we were, put up against that I think we really needed to learn about the individual self-care rather than looking for different outlets. And even as a therapist, when I was working with my clients, like my goal and I would communicate it is, I want one day for you to no longer rely on coming here to see me. I want you to have a Rolodex of coping skills. I want you to learn as many tools as possible to know hey, this is what I can depend on right now, or if it's not serving me for this particular issue or trigger, then I have other aspects to look at. Um, so yeah, I think that that did, people were forced to kind of figure out on their own, like, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to take up this time? How am I supposed to cope in such extreme measures? So how, how are you um, dealing with because I mean, you're in the you're in the midst of a significant transition, right? From doing what you had been, you went to school for, and, and, and doing that type of work to now being an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. How has that transition, or how is it for you right now? Um, I mean, it's been a difficult process, and it's difficult because I never got any sense of training in terms of business like boom you got a business work it out no one does <laughs> yeah you're literally like treading water unknown territory by yourself and it can feel extremely isolating and you have your personal ego who's saying you know you dedicated 10 years of your life under this yeah. training for a specific field that was so cookie cutter and now you're kind of you're innovating it that is not very typical for art therapists. I mean, I, I tell people who are interested in the field, like, hey, unless you want to work in a hospital or a clinic, you know, if you're just looking for private practice or you're looking for something really new, it might not be the best route. Although, you know, it did bring me to where I am today. So I obviously have to honor the training and be grateful for it. But it's been extremely vulnerable for me and i um i had to look for different outlets right listen to different podcasts or start reading different books about entrepreneurship or you know accepting that today i kind of feel crappy and maybe i need to cry it out or like just reach out to a friend who would listen and all of those things kind of helped keep me going mm -hmm. um and today, I would say that COVID actually allowed me to find other people in my circle, like my extended circle that I might not have ever joined forces with. And now I actually have a team of two really supportive women that believe in the brand and believe with, in me. So when I do feel down, they sort of hype me up, even if I'm not um, expressing that vulnerability. It's like I might have a bad day or I feel kind of crappy and you're like, 
I don't know, is this, am I doing the right thing? But they're just like, oh my God, I love this content. I love this. I love that. And you're like, okay, I guess I got something really going here for them to really uh, believe in the brand. I'm sorry. One second. Sure. Well, I got a question. She'll be back. So um, now that you're, you're transitioning into a brand, so you, you really have been in business for what, about a year and a half now or two years? I guess if you want to call the, the market research, I, I still feel like I'm sort of in there. But yeah, I mean, I've been making the formulas for about two years. Okay. I haven't really shared it with too many people. I would say it's been like a year and a half of that. Okay. And, and have you have you already begun your process of um, uh, cause, cause you can you can patent a formula mm -hmm. as well. So have have you gone through that process of, of trying to get can you patent get, get, the formula? Yeah. Yeah. You can patent the formula. It was something early on that I was considering, but just off of the um, business mentors that I've been following, they do say that sometimes it can be a waste of your money because it's extremely expensive. So it would cost like thousands of dollars to uh, patent one formula. So if you have a line of 28 products, that's a lot of money that you're investing in. And they tend to say that like, yeah, it's, it only lasts for 10 years. So after that, you put all this money down as you're still developing and it kind of becomes like a wasted investment. So they aren't patented. Um, however, it might be, I mean, obviously I think it'll be something to really consider as I grow as a really big brand. And I yeah. am working with an ingredient called Mastic, which is sort of like this uh, really underrated uh, ingredient that is the new wonder drug that we that research is um, is finding um, so that will probably be stuff like I said to to consider for the future yeah I would ask if you I would only I would suggest definitely talking to a patent attorney have you talked to patent to a patent attorney about it yet um, I've spoken I've spoken to some I've gotten some referrals on who to reach out to but Again, they kind of recommended like hold off a little bit mm -hmm. um, because I mean, I'm not sure like sometimes form like formulas you might want to adjust or right. how does, or that work? Up, does that affect it? I'm not really sure, but I think that that's something again, like as I grow, as more people join the team, you get a little bit more um, guidance and advice and mm -hmm. I'm trained to follow my intuition and it's been strengthened through therapy. So I think that will help be the guiding decision for me on as to what's the right step to take in the right moment. Right. Right. So um, tell us more about how you're, how you've developed the brand and how your following is and how, how do you end up? Well, answer those two first and then I'll come up with the, the come with the next question. Yeah. Um, well, the foundation has always been therapeutic. So it's always really focused on, like I said, as a therapist, I say, I want you to have as many tools as possible. So that's really what I consider my products to be and the process to be. It's very much think of this as, as a little form of therapy. Um, since COVID, I've really been doing a lot of self-reflection. I've been doing a lot of um, inner exploration in terms of my cultural background and you know, this year we had an election year and it was really crazy and we're talking about democracy and my background is in Greek, in, in, is Greek based. And so I just did a lot of that self-exploration and I thought to myself, how can I connect with what might natural be, naturally be embedded in my DNA? And as a culture, we are um, very much in tune with hospitality, with ethics and values and with a concept called filotimo, which doesn't exactly have a translate exact translation in English, but what it means is to live with values and honor and empathy and to provide that goodness for other people. Mm -hmm. So that really helped shape the brand. And I think that we all have, um, the DNA of knowing our culture and becoming more self-aware of our culture can help really 
expand on what are our natural strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I found my natural strength was from doing that inner exploration on top of the creativity, on top of the natural, intuitive, empathic nature that I have. And so it's kind of like just a bunch of layers, you know, it's, it's hard to, to peel them one by one. Um, and I think it's still a process that I'm figuring out myself. And I'm sure maybe in the near future or a year from now or wherever, I'll, I might be able to even communicate that on an even clearer basis. So I hope I answered I your it. question right. I, okay. got it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was pretty clear. Right. <laughs> so, um, no, no, no. You just said you had a third one. So no, I did. Uh, I do. I'm trying to figure out how to articulate it. So I know you said that you started with friends and family, and most, most of us do. Mm-hmm. But was it, I guess I'm wondering, how does someone in their, you know, get to the point where they're, they're at, they think, okay, I want, I, I imagine most people don't like say, okay, I want to pursue I want to get a stress reliever and I want aromatherapy. How do you make that connection or how do you get, how do customers come to you or how does that work? Are you, is it more about the education you put out and then you're waiting for your customer to find you and come back to you or how does that work? I think people are just perhaps drawn to the fact that it is a therapist making the product. Um, I think that there's a level I don't want to use the word desperation, but this need of getting help that we all need. Mm -hmm. And we've all been so challenged over the last few years that we do have a tendency to have a difficulty finding a therapist. We have difficulty expressing ourselves. And so I think that might be a driving force that connects me, them, and the product for them to purchase. And I mean, I don't want to toot my own horn, but my products are great. (laughs) And uh, I do see that if someone purchases one time, there does tend to be a repurchase. So I, I also feel that, you know, when we're talking about empathy, I do think that as a therapeutic healer, I put all my energy in my work. And that does get translated onto a tangible object. Mm -hmm. And even as an art therapist, I'm fully aware of this. When I look at someone's art, I can feel the emotion. I can feel the trauma that they've experienced. Sometimes it's on an emotional tendency. Sometimes it's literally in physical manifestation. And Mm -hmm. I think there's something there with that, at least I'm aware of, and I'll put that in my work. So even if I'm having a difficult day or something is not really putting me in the right headspace, I'm not going to make product Mm -hmm. because I don't want that to get translated. Translated into, mm -hmm. yeah. So are are you um, right now in the stage of, is it just you that's creating the product or do you have like co-packers that that help you create your product? It's just me. Um, I know that co-packing will have to be something that I'll have to pursue in the future. And I kind of have a little bit of resistance to it because like I said, I I don't want the product to just be a random product. I want it to be something that is alive, that has this healing energy, that has this goodness, this sense of ethics and values. Mm -hmm. I want it to be translated translated in that way and I think by crafting it by hand it does get translated and so I'm not sure I've I'm considering perhaps having other people who join my team they have to be aligned with the same values Mm -hmm. and if they're going to make the product I think that that will will be able to get translated yep I was going to say the same thing you need to get you have to create a core group of individuals that believe in you and believe in your product mm-hmm. that will translate into whatever they make for you. Yeah. At the same time, you're able to because once you go to Copacker, it's a whole new ball game in terms of what the integrity of your product is going to be. I'm sure. You know, they're even yeah. 
they don't and point blank they're not going to care about it the way that you care about it so yeah exactly. I, agree. I, I mean some of them won't so, so, some of them won't Most so won't. i mean I, I would I would say that you 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 can but it's you can a business. you gotta realize you, it's a business at that point. You can take you can take your time and really do some due diligence and find a co-packer, right? You know, if you're blessed enough to to continue to grow that way, that has those values, right? Um, and has a, has the same energy that you have, and that will pour the love that you want to pour into your product. Um, you can find it. You just you're just gonna have to do some due diligence. Right. It, it, it's not just going to be the first person you Google and what. I think it's going to be far, few and far between, because when you get to that, if you if you get to the point where you need a co-packer that is strictly just give me your formulas and we'll take it from there, that's a totally different situation. Mm -hmm. If it's your she's able to maintain her own core group, and I we're always for bring it in house before you can out before outsourcing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything of the week, um, but it's a matter of we had to, for us it ha we had to change our thinking to stop thinking in, in minimals and then thinking of what I can do, what's the maximum I can do, you know, mm -hmm. thinking of, of next steps and, and all in between. But it might be the, the a simple, you know, her fulfillment. Maybe she can outsource, but she keeps she keeps all of her co her actual producing her product in house. Oh yeah, yeah. And also, I mean, we're we're in this um american culture is so, and i'm sure obviously in like other parts of the world too like everything's made by machine everything is made like all these robots are going to be taking over all of our jobs and <laughs> <laughs> i mean i just think that maybe we do need to take a step back yeah. uh it's my personal belief that i think that we we it doesn't work to be too big. It just doesn't. Um, I mean, we see, look at Amazon. We have all these issues that have come about from Amazon. They treat their workers like crap. Mm -hmm. And there's one guy that's pretty much benefiting from it. All these small businesses are going out of business. We have, you know, big fast food chains that might go global, but they're not giving you this, the quality mm -hmm. of products that we deserve. Mm -hmm. And, even if you look at something like the Roman Empire, right? Even from back then, like why didn't we learn the lesson that it's it's just too big? They literally had to break apart because right. it just didn't work. So I don't know. Maybe we'll get a culture shift. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I've I've thought about that. Like, how big do I really want to be? My goal is to not just set up myself. I want to set up others. Right. Yeah. But right. I mean, I'm not going to do it in a selfish way because I just don't think that's part of my makeup. I don't think that's right. I believe in karma and I think that would like right. bite me in the ass in the future. Right. It's going so. to. It is. It is. And that's the thing. It's like, what is your driving force? Is your driving force money or is your driving force relationships? Is your, you know what I mean? Is it driving? It, and I think that, you know, society for a while there, just really took for granted um, the essence of a relationship, the, the building relationships and the, the community, you know, building your community and things like that when it comes to business. And I think a lot, and I think a lot of it, even with COVID is like, you know what, everybody needs to slow down and step back and see what's important, figure out what's important and what's not important. Because a lot of stuff that we were doing before mm -hmm. that we cannot do now, it's like, oh, the world kept turning. The sun did rise, <laughs> you know, when I can't go stand in line for Starbucks or whatever. So I do think it's like, it, it comes down to, I think the world is making a shift and realize the important, realizing the importance of the togetherness and being small and not having to be the conglomerate or whatever. And it's like, that's still success. What is what their version, what your version of success doesn't have to match everybody else's version of success. Right. And, and, you know, even just thinking about, about um, situations like, can you fund this? Can you fund, is it cheaper to go down a co-packing route rather than, um, paying each individual well i mean i've even thought about like why not do it as an internship 
Mm-hmm. I think everyone in high school should work. Mm-hmm. And listen, I've done my fair share of free work and it's taught me a lot and it's even made me humble. And I think it's helped shape me into the entrepreneur that I am today. So there's different methods of being able to offer a learning lesson, offer an experience. It doesn't just have to be financial. It can be through this like educational route. Aromatherapy is kind of new in a way. Um, Even when it comes to the, um, the education, we, they've only had a certification recently to be acknowledged and there's not much um, like reading on it. There's not many books about it. So it is kind of new. And for someone like myself, that was, it's kind of shocking. Like, okay, am I the person who's supposed to like make it super popular beyond the plant therapy and the uh, doTERRA, those like large MLM corporations? Mm -hmm. And why not offer it as an educational tool for someone who's much younger that can kind of get this pathway of, oh, this is an option. This can be a career. Right. Right. You get set at your there's some you can have more of a personal experience and satisfaction with pursuing something like because you can see tangibly what difference that you're making right there in front of you Mm -hmm. exactly um so we need to know more about the brand itself and the products itself and how they work and how you've come up with your formulas without giving away too much information but at the same time Mm -hmm. you know just tell us about that well, um, my products, like I said, it's it's easy self care tools. So do you have they can, to show us. Um, what do I have? I'm in my parents' house today. So <laughs> give me a second. I think I have something here. No worries. <laughs> Let me see what I I'm still here, guys. Don't worry. Don't worry. Because <laughs> <laughs> so I was just wondering if there's a how big of a market it is, how big of an industry it is. It's huge because it's not based on it's not based on a niche. You know, what I mean? she's not serving a, a she's not providing a problem a solve but she's not providing a solution for only a niche group of people she's providing right. a solution for anybody so so if, if it's that big then then to me that that would mean that or there could be um a high level of competition if it's and not- i think you're right on that and the reason why is i've seen since covid everyone is promoting self-care Mm-hmm. A lot of the beauty industry, which is a booming industry, I think it's like supposed to be worth like 50 billion by 20 something in the next like 10 years is now pivoting to self-care and wellness. And that's all you hear now. I'm a wellness coach. I'm, you know, promoting fitness for wellness. I've even see ads for vodka that have an I essence know, lavender like, and they're I- like, for your self care. Oh, really? We're like we're gonna right, we're gonna really. believe in ourselves and call it self care. Cool. Right. <laughs> so there's definitely an industry. I think that the big companies are seeing it and they're jumping on it right now. But again, like unless you're there for the, if your heart is in it and the purpose is in it, you'll shine through. And that's what I'm hoping that Aramanti brings over the course of the next ten years. Um, and obviously you'll have like the MLMs, like even now you have, again, I'm going to call out doTERRA because they're a giant MLM. And young they, Living. <laughs> yeah, Young Living. Did yeah. you watch that Essential Oil episode on Netflix? No. Do they have uh, one? Did they spill the beans on that one too? Did um, they the, the tea? <laughs> what is the documentary called? It just came out a few months ago. Ugh. I'm going to get back to you on it, but their first episode is about essential oils and how, yes, there's this like healing, wonderful aspect, but then you have MLMs 
exploiting it and like screwing over, over a lot of housewives and moms. Right, right. And purchase. But yeah, I mean, there's also like the cult factor that I think we're all susceptible to that could be like the manipulation of marketing. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll see. I mean, we'll really see. Interesting. I would love to see that because my, my sister's drinking the juice like crazy. <laughs> yeah, you have to be careful. We underestimate how powerful they are. I mean, a little drop of essential oil might not seem like a lot, mm -hmm. but we have to recognize that it's highly concentrated. And these things can affect uh, specific medical conditions that we might have or overusing it. You're, you're essentially abusing it. And there can be a lot of negative effects, allergies that can be developed from it. And so unless you're under the proper guidance and a trained professional, you're, you can really hurt yourself. And I don't think that these large companies have that. And I was able to see the potential, the potency, just because I was my own guinea pig, you know, applying mm -hmm. essential oil on my face. And guess what? Then I developed a burn mark mm -hmm. because I saw how intense it was. And I said to myself, I can't. I can't produce something for someone else to use knowing that this is so potentially dangerous. It's, mm -hmm. it's in a way medicine and we wouldn't just like offer antibiotics for no reason. Right. So, so do you, do you provide that type of education with it's your something, Yeah. It's something that I started to do. I, I began doing workshops for like the basics. How do you just handle essential oils? What's the right way to store how can you determine if it's gone bad, um, proper dosage? And just the other day, my teammate was like, you have to go deeper. You have to do something more along the lines of, like I said, explaining that it can affect specific medical conditions and whatnot. And uh, my partner is an ER doctor who recently got certified in um, integrative medicine. So he now sees from the medical aspect, the potentials of working with herbs and plant material. And so we've kind of decided like, okay, let's join forces and see how can we really make it in the safest way possible. Um, and using it, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna call it medicine because there's a lot of like liability issues with that, but using it as a safe tool as you would any other product that's totally transparent. But um, I do have one of my products here. I don't know if you could see it. Oh, but, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this one here is a three-in-one daytime moisturizer. So again, tying into something like easy self-care, you have someone who maybe doesn't like to focus on their skincare routine. Um, this is three products in one. So it's a toner, a moisturizer, and a natural SPF. And it's made with mastic, which is that ingredient that I told you about. Um, there's evidence that shows that it's uh, really helpful for wound healing, scar therapy. Um, it's a really amazing uh, antioxidant. And uh, a lot of people have used it in the past for skin issues. I know that in World War II, they would use it for the soldiers who developed wounds. And even now I know of a, I've heard of a doctor who patented mastic for um, surgical glue. Mm. So when you have a, a skin, like a wound that you can't bandage up, they'll put this glue on and the main ingredient is mastic. So there's potential, the medical community sees it. Um, I, as a local from the island that it derives from, have known this. I mean, it's an ancient ingredient, so we've all known the medicinal properties, but it's nice to see that there's scientific evidence. And as someone who is a therapist, I, you know, the more evidence we have, the more validity and reliability, the better. So how many products do you have within your line? Um... I have four for skincare. Okay. I have eight. Those. Like break it down, break down each um, set of products. Yeah. So it, it derives by collection. So there's okay. an emotional wellness collection, a physical wellness, and a skincare collection. Okay. Um, and also a daily wellness collection. So 
I think that the, uh, the daily wellness is really just a basics. You can use it every single day. It focuses on the most general common issues like insomnia, um, dry skin, and sensitive skin as well. So there's no essential oil in the hypoallergenic body butter for that purpose. Mm -hmm. And um, that also includes kind of like a energizing formula and a stress relief. So okay. you can use any of those products any time of day. And uh, then there's the emotional that really focuses on the mental health or, you know, as a woman, I've dealt with the issues of self-esteem and identity and, um, you know, the issue that women typically come across, which is be small, right? Don't take risks. Mm -hmm. um, your voice is not as loud as your male counterpart. So these are derived to help boost courage to overcome uh, negative thinking. And they're not just designed for women. Uh, we all have that yin and yang concept. There's a masculine energy in us and a feminine. So this really takes over that feminine energy. Um, and then the physical wellness obviously focuses more on the physical. So healthy circulation, there's um, everyday common cold issues like stuffy nose, headaches, and pain relief. So that kind of breaks it down by collection. And then each of those collections has a body butter, has um, inhalers, uh, some have sprays, and my skincare collection falls under wash, a face toner, a face oil, and then this three-in-one product. So it caters to all different aspects of the type of collection and self-care. So it really, it's, it's very targeted to your personal needs and preference. So are you primarily selling through your e-commerce store? Yeah, originally I was, um, when I was selling to friends and family, obviously that was more in person. And then mm -hmm. before COVID hit, I was beginning uh, my market research in some local flea markets for artists. And I was seeing a response, a really positive response with that. Uh, but then once COVID hit, I just had to pivot and focus strictly on e-commerce. So over the last couple of months, I would say from May until about last week, uh, my, my goal was to amplify the e-commerce uh, platform because you're obviously dealing with competition and Google ads and Facebook ads and all of that. So that's been the main, the main goal to conquer. So, um, can you take one of your lines? Like if I were to come to you and say, you know, I like right now I'm having serious eczema issues on both sides of my, both, what is this, my forearm? Shoulder. Shoulder, thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is the forearm, right? Yes. This is my ankle? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, so, and I believe it's really stress related. So I've got two, I've got winter stress, and then, um, you know, there's several outlying, you know, there's more than just one factor as to what makes this come because I never get rid of it. It's just whether it flares up or not. So if I were to come to you and say, you know what, I know I'm, I know I'm like deeply under stress right now and I can feel that it's flaring up. What would you do? Like, what would you tell me? And how would, how would we go ahead with, how would we engage in the conversation of what your advice would be for me? Uh, that's a really good question. I think I would begin first by just trying to gauge like, what is the intention for you to heal? Are you someone that's looking more towards the physical aspect or are you a believer that, you know, stress can influence the physical body? Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, I think you need to ask yourself, what is it that I really want to cater to? And then I can kind of help guide you as the aromatherapist. I don't want to give you the direct answer. That's not exactly what we do. And see, yeah, yeah. that's what I want to know. I want to know how does because some people are just like, you know what, give me the cream that matches my symptoms. And that's yeah. not what you do. You're, you're, from what I'm gathering, you're digging down deeper to find out exactly what are the different, just like you said, the layers that may be contributing and which, 
She's actually doing, which layer do I really therapy. does bother me the most and what do I want? So, okay. So keep going. I just kind of like cut you off. Sorry. No, no, it's okay. And, um, and you're right. Yeah. It's in a way it's therapy without, uh, necessarily calling it traditional therapy, but I think it takes a little bit of that self-assessment that you, uh, personally gravitate towards and listening to your gut. And then essentially a lot of essential oils play dueling roles. So I like to see if it's something that we're communicating in person. I like to present you with all the different aromas and see what do you gravitate towards. And that in combination with learning what is your goal allows me to really direct you to the correct product. Um, so yes, you want to heal your eczema or your psoriasis or whatever it might be, but a lot of like my product might have frankincense in it, which is very grounding and earthly mm -hmm. and is known to really, it's like a warm blanket in terms of your emotions and mental health and well being. Mm -hmm. Where lavender in itself is not necessarily stimulating, it's more on that nurturing side. So it's the product as the base, like the, uh, the carrier oils serve as the base, the foundational ground of what part of the body are we tar tar targeting what is the method of application and then how can the formula cater to the emotional or the overall goal mm -hmm. so with it being in a time where you can't necessarily have that one-on-one -on -one, you know i can't smell everything and i can't you know um you can't present to me all the different things you know one-on-one -on -one, so how does it, how have you pivoted to be able to have that same effective consultation, but it's virtually? So how does that work? It's something that my team and I have been strategizing on over the last like month or so uh, between our content creation and the descriptive language you have to really paint the picture. And it is difficult, I have to admit, it's not an easy process. However, I think the more people that can offer their personal perspective, like buyers or influencers, whatever, whoever it might be that's explaining themselves in their own words, how they feel and using sensory integration to do so, saying, how does this physically make me feel? How do I communicate that? And what's the descriptive mm -hmm. language? language? Mm -hmm visually how does it make me feel when i open up the box um aromatically the first scent that i get or what is the sensation if i spray my face is it cooling is it is it um comfortable or uncomfortable these are mm -hmm. the questions i think once they're they're um documented and presented to the audience they'll be able to make a deeper understanding okay and then too i wonder if it's one of those things where it's would be beneficial to have tiny samples. Mm. Yeah, I do offer samples and I like to throw in a little psychology of the buyer when, when they purchase a specific item, then I'll think about like, oh, what might complement them? And I'll, I'll throw in the correct samples. So whether that's like a stress relief spray or a toner, it depends on what I see, what is their purchasing pattern. Right, right. So it's also, a little trial and error mm -hmm. building that relationship too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're making a guesstimate of what is the, the best product to introduce um, and to keep the buyer to hold on, right. Mm -hmm. To, to mm -hmm. purchase again. Um, but it is, it is quite interesting. And that's like the fun part for me. That's like the psychologist to me. That's like, <laughs> how, how can I grab more attention through this? Yeah. So, so I know you said, you know, you had a thought about where you would be in, in 10 years. And, and I was, I was look at, looking at your vision and your mission and your vision mentioned about wanting to be a household name. And so but not, where, 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 where's your head at for, let's just say for the next five years. So by 2025, where do you see where you would be with, with your company? Sometimes I don't like to think that far ahead. Um, 
I, I try to be very mindful, but generally, I don't know. I just, I have this visual image of me walking into a building and I see a lot of people that are working under me. I, I see a lot of diverse individuals who have the common goal to impact society in a positive way, yeah. who uh, believe in the same ethics, who believe in transparency, openness, and it's my personal motive to make sure that they're set up. Mm -hmm. I want to amplify who they are. And um, that's kind of, I think, as deep as I can go. Mm -hmm. Sort of what I've touched on. But I do, I do want to see Aramanthi at the same level of recognition as Burt's Bees. But, ah. Yeah, mm -hmm. knowing that it's clean because I'm not stupid. And I know what products are in these, uh, what ingredients are in these products. And I know that, you know, we, our culture lives on a very individualistic society and doesn't mind screwing people over for their own personal gain. And uh, I know that we don't read labels. Yep. So for me, I put a little bit of effort into reading labels or shopping. I have to Google every ingredient. Um, and I got fed up and I said, screw this, I'm going to make my own. And I want everyone to understand what each ingredient is, or at least make it easy enough to discover what it is if they don't know a specific plant essence that I'm using. So, yeah, I, I hope I translated. Yeah, no, no, that was good. Um, and, and I mean, I, I've enjoyed the conversation and I wanted you to know that from a puff cuff perspective and from Cedar and I's perspective, that as, as you grow your community, know that you have another spot you can go to, another, another set of entrepreneurs that you can go to to bounce ideas off, to, to just vet, to, just to think about, hey, I'm, I'm on this journey. How, how, how do I properly go down this journey given my values, given my ethics, given everything? Um, and we want you to know that you, you have two more, two more sets of ears mm -hmm. and hearts that, that you, can, you can rely on. So, so I, and I appreciate your conversation. And, and what you've brought to the table because it's been enlightening. It really has. Wow, thank you so much. I just got goosebumps. Thank you. I really, <laughs> I appreciate that because it's isolating and um, it's hard, right? Like, not is it's, how long have you been on this journey? Um, I guess it's sort of approaching two years. Okay. From start to finish yeah. and. Yeah, I mean, I've cried so many times and I'm kind of over it, but I know it's going to happen. <laughs> but having the support, like you said, is is what's going to keep me going. And I I really i am very grateful for what you just translated to me. Really grateful. Yes, You're definitely. Welcome. I think we're... Isaac, how are we? We got one minute, Isaac. Ah, see? See, I was not I looking at the, the fingers. One minute. <laughs> did, he, did he give us a finger before? Yeah, not he did. the finger. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he gave us five before. <laughs> Can I just mention one more thing? Yes, um, so I want to give you and your viewers a personal discount code. Um, so the code is invention uh, on the website and you'll get 10% off. So that'll be active once we, once we end our conversation. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I already know. Um, let me ask this. I'm sorry. Is there a certain time that should be based on? We'll, yeah, we'll let you know when it airs and okay. then, we'll you make, yeah, it. then you can activate it at that time. That's fine. Do people get personal consoles with you or how does that work? Um, I, I need a console. <laughs> it's not super popular. I mean, I totally will give one for you if you need one. Um, so if you want, send me an email and we can set up a time and um, I'll kind of give you a little template that you can fill out to help you navigate what you need but we can chat i can i can definitely direct you to the right product or if you need something custom i'm happy to make something for you is that part of your portfolio though to of your offerings to do personal consults um it isn't it isn't like like i said it's something that i'll do usually it, it's in person if somebody asks me um mm -hmm. but yeah i should put that 
on the website. Yeah, because I'm thinking if you give me a personal consult, then we can record that. And then you use that for content too. And maybe it's another upsell on your site that. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Um, it's kind of like, have you ever been to the doctor's office and they make you fill out this like form? Mm -hmm. So that's usually what I'll give and then kind of determine from there. So I don't know how deep you want to go if you want to do it as a recorded thing. Um, but, you know, you let me know what you feel comfortable with. Okay. Sounds good. Even if mm -hmm. it's just a snippet, but at least then the uh, potential customer will get a feel for what they're going to receive from you. Right. Yeah. That's cool. Sounds good. Awesome. All righty. Thank you guys so Thank much for this so opportunity. Much. Thank oh, you. Oh, you, you know what? Can you, can you give oh, um, your, your website, Instagram, all those handles yeah. and all that stuff? Yes. You want me to translate it now while we're on the we're yeah. live? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the website is aromanthi.com and the Instagram is at aromanthi underscore clean beauty. And I can always uh, send you links to those as well if you want to put them on your, your description. Yes, please. And then is, does aromanthi mean anything? Yeah, so it's a play on Greek words, um, aroma for scent. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. anthi in Greek means blooming flower. So it falls aligned with the ah. blooming flower of the logo. That's nice. Oh, nice. Okay. Now I see it. You guys are going to have to practice rolling your R's. So it's going to be Arromanti. Arromanti. Yeah, there you go. I'll have you like, Garrett, can you say it, please? Because <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> yes, very nice. Well, thank you. It was great talking with you, Angelica. And we really, really enjoyed this. Yep. And, um, you sharing your mission and vision for this. Because it, I believe it's really going to... It's what people need, and because you're coming from a genuine place, oh, yeah. I think it's gonna take it's gonna take off. Thank you, I appreciate that. Alrighty, so that's it for us. Yeah. So you gonna sign off? Cause I signed in. Oh, cause. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, thank you everybody for tuning in to this episode of Idea to Invention, and uh, thank you Angelica so much for your time and, and for your your wisdom. We sure do appreciate it, and we wish many blessings on you and your company. Um, and as we always say in parting, take care yes. and be a blessing. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.